Hi, this is Tom Stewart with the Cleaning Business Today. Um, I'm back with my partner, Liz Trotter, and we've got Matt Ricketts joining us today. So, uh, you know, another afternoon of talking about smart business moves uh, for uh, you know, dealing with the coronavirus if you're in the uh, house cleaning business. Um, Liz and I were chatting earlier today, and we got. <laughs> uh oh. Every time. <laughs> I do this every time. I tried to get it before, but I didn't. Sorry, y'all. Oh, okay. Liz, Liz and I were chatting later today, or earlier today, rather, and um, she was sharing some, some discussions she had with some other cleaning business owners and, uh, I guess, things that we should be thinking about right now. You know, yesterday we said that, you know, we sh if we haven't gotten past the financial part of this in terms of applying for our loans and pushing our debt, off and all of that. We need to be getting there real quick because, you know, we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do with our cleaning businesses when the coronavirus starts to taper down and, and things, you know, I don't know what normal is going to look like, but it's going to be different than it is now. I mean, a lot of us are shut down. And for those of us who aren't shut down, you know, we've got a lot of customers that don't want us in their home. So, you know, what do we need to be doing now to kind of get ready for what's next? And Liz, you were sharing some, some, some of the discussions that you were having today. Yeah, uh, we are talking about, you know, there's basically two different groups. There are, there's a group of people that is already shut down um, for whatever reason. And then there's the group of people or companies that are still running, right, still operating. Um, but for both groups, anybody that's getting the PPP, which pretty much I think is all of us, we're all trying to get it at least, we need to... We need to be at the very latest, we need to sort of be up and kind of running hardcore the beginning of May so that we can get all of May and all of, all of June. I mean, ideally, so that we can get our best opportunity to get our eight weeks of, of um, payroll forgiven, right? So how do we be up and running on, so May 3rd is a Monday, <laughs> right? How are we up and running full steam ahead on May 3rd? And two prongs, one is the client and the second is the employees. We need, need to have enough employees and we need to have enough clients. Neither one is you know, going to be good without the other. And so um, what the main, main thing we're talking about today is because we've been talking a lot about the employees over the past couple of weeks, right? I think everybody's been talking a lot about that. But what are we doing to prep the clients? How are we getting them ready? A lot of them have, um, a lot of them have already skipped or just gone on hold for a short period of time. They've donated money. They said, "I'll keep paying, but don't come clean." So all of those things are telling us that they. The customers are of the mindset that it's not good to have us out cleaning yet. They're even willing to pay to keep us away. <laughs> so, so, and of course, it's not because they're trying desperately to keep us away, but it's important enough that they're willing to. They want to support us, but they still don't want us in. So, trying to change that narrative and coming up with some strategies. I was saying that we need to be looking to begin changing that narrative now about start thinking about having us back out, why it would be a good idea to have us back out, why you want us back out. Uh, I share, was sharing a graph. Uh, I think I that you and I were looking at this graph earlier today, Tom, the healthdata.org graphs that show where the um, uh, the resources, you know, the research use, like in my state, the, it's been five days since peak resource use on April 2nd. And so looking at that graph, it's showing us that in May, we're going to be in a pre, oh, we lost Tom. Sorry, Tom. I kicked him off talking about graphs. He got too excited, you know. That's well, still looking Hopefully we're still live because isn't he the one in charge of this thing? No, we're still live. On screen, on stream, we're on StreamYard, so it's still okay. live. Um, and so anyway, talking about different things that we can start telling our customers about why it's going to be really safe and what, what maybe tapping into some loss aversion. Hey, Tom, good yeah. to have you back. 
Okay. <laughs> I clicked on the wrong button there, but we're all good. Um, um, tapping into like some a loss of version, maybe some scarcity, uh, so that they start getting like, and we kind of have to do these in order. It's going to be safe. It's going to be great. Start getting ready for it. Here's good reasons why it's okay to start thinking about having your house clean and then hitting them with some scarcity and some loss aversion. Yeah. Like, so, go ahead. Oh, no. So, yeah, I think like we, we need to first kind of format it into a time frame of when we're going to be reopening and, and really start communicating that to your customers ahead of time, whether or not you're going to hit that target or not. Um, and, and what your goals are for reopening. Um, I'm going to open up, um, I'm going to, if, if you guys let me share, I, I'm going to open up a, a communication we sent out to our customers uh, in blog form here, but um, see if my uh, computer will let me open up another window here. But I mean, I think that's a, I think that's the first thing is you need to, you need to pick a date, whether or not you're going to hit that date or not. We don't know, right? You don't, you don't have a, you don't have a crystal ball what all the what all the information is going to be that's going to make you to, that's going to help you make that decision um, but i think you need to have some some goals in mind so let me uh, let me go back and let me share my screen i'm going to just show something um, that we sent out via via email but also um, let's see um, should be a button at the bottom that says there we go yeah, yeah. let me go over here all right, so we did this thing, an update to temporary service suspension. We sent this out to our customers. And basically, we talked about our goals through the crisis. So, you know, what, what, what we're trying to accomplish right now. So we're trying to con contribute to the community effort to slow the spread of the virus, ensure the health and safety of our staff and clients, and ensure the long-term health and continuity of the business. So obviously, that's an important goal too, right? So we, we want to be upfront and honest about that. And we, we also described how we're going to make our decision to come back to work. Um, so we're waiting, you know, that we're, we're trying to make sure that peak infection in St. Louis never exceeds the amount of available beds, critical care resources. And so we don't want to be a part of, you know, any community spread when the worst of this is going on. But we're also clear that we're going to work in an environment where COVID-19 exists. We're going to do some things to mitigate that. We're looking for the lifting of strict stay-at-home orders. Um, our statewide order ends on April 27th. Um, and our city order ends on April 24th. So I'm hoping somewhere in that window, um, we'll do that. And <clears throat> excuse me, we're also looking at some customers that have some customer need, the client needs. We're, we're actually bringing a couple people back right now because we're getting a lot of empty clean re requests and things like that. So I'm back up to about six technicians um, next week, I believe. So, you know, from, from 36 to six, it's not, um, it's not ideal. But it's 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 there. And then you know, Liz was talking about offers to continue to pay. We created an employee uh, assistance fund. Joe Walsh gave me the idea of doing this, and we've collected about two thousand dollars so far. So um, I'm going to match a thousand of that and give, uh, and hopefully I get it up to about thirty six hundred, so I can give out a hundred dollar gift card to all of my employees. And I've also sold about fifteen thousand in um, in gift cards uh, since we closed. But the, but the idea is that we're communicating this. So our goal, we actually had April 20th in this blog post, but on the email, we actually changed it uh, that actually finalized. I need to edit this. Uh, we said we would try and reopen on the 24th, in fact. So uh, that's later that same week. Um, and, and, and in advance of that, we're, we're putting together some, some internal steps and some external steps um, as far as things that we're going to do to reopen. Um, so all the clients that are on that week, about a week out, we're going to email them. Um, we're going to basically run a report in our, in our, in, in our software made central, and then we can email them directly. But if you don't have that, just, we're going to communicate with them a week out, see if, if they're ready for us. And then if they're not, you know, we're going to, we're going to pull them down ahead of time. So we know, have a better idea with staffing and we're going to call everyone individually too, so that we aren't kind of caught flat footed with that. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the share here and give it back. But that's, that's one form of communication. We're going to keep, we're going to keep doing that sort of stuff. And then we're kind of writing out our plan for both the staff timing, timing what we need to do with them and timing what we need to do with the, with the employees, or I'm sorry, with the clients. And, and again, there's so much in, up in the air still, it could all just be a guess, but you need to be doing something right. So it's, yeah. uh, 
I, I shared a, a link in the uh, chat to, to a website. I'll, I'll just plug this up here real quick because I think it's useful. This was uh, what Liz was uh, referring to. Um, the link is, <laughs> we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll post this on Cleaning Business Today too on our, our resource page, but you can go to, <laughs> oh, this is country, wait a minute. I took you to the wrong Just one. go down, Tom. Just go down on that scrolly button and it goes to states. It's on yeah. my blog. It's on my blog too. So if you go right to Better Life page. United States of America, Tom, go up to where it says United States of America. Mm -hmm. And then click on the carrot and then go down. Scroll down. And you'll find whatever state you want. I got you. So if you want to know what country is going to be hitting peak, you can do that too. But yeah. Um, I don't know. Let's pick a state. Yeah, we're we're nine days away from peak in the United States, is what it's saying. And so, you know, so by state, you're in Kansas, right? I'm in Missouri now. Thank you. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, twelve days. Yeah, you're on the nineteenth. Ooh, you got a yep. ways to go. But we're five days past, so we're in a really great place. Yeah. It's different. It's going to be different everywhere. So yeah, we're, we're 12 days, 11 or 12 days from peak. And, you know, again, that kind of court that coincides with my plans to open late April, um, we'll be on the downslide. People will start, you know, being able to, to know that resources aren't going to be constrained in hosp hospitals. Um, to be perfectly honest, I don't think we're going to see a total normalization of society until mid May, maybe early June. So that's how do you know what total is a is a is a big word i mean yeah oh, you're, right. Like you're right you're right total we're, but i do i do expect restaurants to be able to be reopened by mid may late late may early june and they're going to just have to have some some spacing and some other some other things we're going to start getting back to normal i believe in mid may early june depending on the region that you're in and you're going to see the whole social distancing part of this, though, is realistically going to be with us until there's some type of vaccine. I mean, the idea of, of large concerts, how professional sports is going to work. I mean, I don't know. Look at China. They're they're having a big national. Um, it's a national holiday this week, and there's lots of big gatherings and and people out in public and things like that. I think that that stuff is going to be is going to be a risk, but it's going to be a, a moderated risk when you have the, when you get the transmission level to like one to one, basically where they know where they can start, go, go back to contact tracing. Right. Had, had we gotten, had we, had we done that on the beginning, we may not have actually gotten to where we are now. And that's, that's probably a rabbit hole to go down to, you know, but we, we get back to the point where, where transmission gets to one to one and we can trace things. I think you can get back to fairly normal life. But I'm not sure you're. I, I'm, I'm sure you're right that I don't know that I personally would be comfortable going to concerts, baseball games, things like that. Um, so, so I'm not sure how those are affected if if they are able to reopen or not. I think a lot of it's going to be the public's desire to do those things, um, and and you know, kind of measuring those risks and and rewards of of society of being able to do those things. <clears throat> but, um, you, you know. I, I think you're right. I think some of the larger gatherings, things like that, live concerts, stuff like that, we're talking maybe fall before we see a resumption of all of that kind of stuff. It would be would be reasonable. So like this, like Iron Man stuff, like I had uh, a race I was supposed to do May 31st. Um, they canceled it for the year. And the earliest races they have scheduled are now September. So um, not that they have any better information than the rest of us, but that's that's their prediction is September is when they're going to be kind of back in business and doing races and stuff like that. Well, I know that when stuff started happening in March, everything sort of got kicked out six months to September. Yeah. Um, pretty much every single thing that I was involved in that got kicked out was kicked to September. Yeah. Um, not all that stuff's happening in September, obviously. Um, but I don't even know. I don't know. I, I haven't put any any faith on that September, September dates for any of the stuff, just because the world is still going to be a little topsy turvy in September, even if it's only because 
every single thing that there is is scheduled to be done in September, right? We're all in competition for September. Yeah, I, I would say this. One thing I kind of want to talk a little bit today about is, is there's a lot of gimmicky stuff going on. Like every, everyone's getting the idea of like fogging and electrostatic sprayers. And, and while I think that those there's, there's some definitely good place in the market, I kind of want to talk about a little bit about some of the ideas that we can all implement to be uh, kind of get ahead of this when we're getting, getting ready to reopen, um, you know, kind of train our staffs, make sure that they're kind of on the same page. Tom, are you ready to share some of the stuff that you've been writing down and, or, and you're going to teach, or is that maybe you want to share that another day or? or we're, we're, we're building an, we're building an agenda. Uh -huh. um, basically questions that, that, that need to be answered. Do we want to jump into that? Okay. I, I think we can just maybe introduce what we're talking about. We don't need to jump into the actual topics, but maybe the broader overview of training and why you're, why you're creating a training and, and versus, you know, versus some of these new gimmicky things, which I think we can all add into our businesses as able. I don't want to call them gimmicky because I think there is some um, benefit to some of them if done properly. Um, what's the right word? Not gimmicky, but new kind of technology-based things like fogging, electrostatic spraying. Um, um, my, my thinking is, I mean, I'm all about gimmicks, you know? I mean, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I say gimmicks. I'm, you know, I'm about technology. You know, engineered water solutions, dry steam vapor, aqueous ozone, hyperchlorous acid. I mean, we used all of that situation, really. You know, ATP studies. But what we're developing for castle keepers and Matt and I have been working together uh, with you know Joe and a few other cleaning business owners to put together a program to use internally to help our cleaning technicians uh, be prepared and know what they need to know and have the skills that they need to clean in what we're calling a post COVID-19 world, or really, I guess, uh, a COVID-19 world too. Um, and, you know, we're going to make the distinction between, you know, forensic deep cleaning and, you know, putting on a Tyvek suit and a respirator and, and you know, going in and wiping out some, you know, virus in a, in, a, in, a, in a hot, you know, internal space. All that's good stuff. And I think it's really good to know that if you're in the cleaning business, because, you know, somebody's going to call you up and say, hey, you know, I've got a house here that, you know, had two people with uh, COVID and you know, we just took them to the hospital. Can you uh, come clean it? Um, you need to know what you're, you're dealing with there to make uh, good decisions. Are you equipped to do it? Are you trained to do it? Uh, you know, do you have the, the, the right people to do it and the right chemicals and so forth? And if you choose to do it, you need to do it the right way. So there's a class that, that, that RFC is doing through GBAT that's a certification class, or at least uh, I guess they give you a certification of completion anyway, certificate of completion. It's going to be an online course. I think it's like forty nine dollars to to RC members, which is 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 is, is really awesome. I'm glad that they're making that accessible. I'm gonna now, take it. Yeah, I'm gonna take it as well. I, I think I think we all should. But that's not this is that's not what we're talking about here. You know, as business owners, we need to understand that that stuff. And if we're gonna do it, we need to train our people or make sure our people are trained to do that type of work. But what we're concerned about, what I'm concerned about, is you know. 99% of the work that we do is cleaning Mrs. Jones's house every other week. So how are we going to do that in a responsible way when things start opening up again? Because the virus isn't going to go away just like that. There's people out there that are still going to have it. And the thinking is it will, it'll die down some over the summer. And if they don't come up with some ways of treating it, some, at least some therapeutics, that it's going to probably pick back up in the fall. And the prediction is that there will be pockets there will be cities that's going to flare up to the point where you know like matt said if we can do contact tracing we might not have to shut the whole city down the way that we're, we're doing now but it's going to be with us for a while so how are we going to clean in a world when when when, when that risk is out there so we want to be able to and, and i'm talking again not forensic cleaning just regular mrs jones's house every other week what we call you know every other week maintenance cleaning. We still have to know what COVID-19 is. We need to understand, you know, 
how to ask the right questions to identify if me as a cleaning technician or your cleaning technician working for you might be at risk. Do they have a fever? Have they traveled to some place that uh, the that, that there's like stay at home orders and some, you know, a, a lot of known cases? Um, have they been in contact with anybody who's been diagnosed? Those types of questions. We need to understand how it spreads. We need to understand what we need to do to stay safe. And we'll just talk about, you know, all the basics, the proper ways to wash your hands. You know, if you're going to sneeze or cough, you know, how, how to do that, just, just the basics. Uh, if I'm a professional house cleaner, what are the things that, that we knew, need to do to stay safe? And you can argue these are things that we should all be doing as professional house cleaners even before this, but we're going to reiterate it because now more so than ever, you know, it, it, could, it could be a matter of life and death if we don't, don't do those things properly and, and, and as well as they can be done. We want to explain what the chain of infection is and how we as cleaning professionals can break that and uh, what we need to know before cleaning a home. You know, this kind of gets back into being able to write, ask the right questions to make sure that, you know, that that home is, is going to be safe and we have a clear understanding of what the scope of work is, which kind of gets into what's the scope of work. And again, if the bar is being raised, for a lot of consumers, for, for a lot of us in the industry, the scope of work was come on in and just kind of make things look good, run the vacuum cleaner, take the trash out, bang, bang. Now the scope of work for a lot of people is going to be, you know, can you make my home safe? You know, tell me about, you know, sanitizing and disinfecting high touch uh, surfaces. What is hygienic home cleaning? The scope of work is going to be higher and it needs to include things like how are we going to keep our customers safe? You know, it needs to include how do we keep our employees safe? Things that we never even really had to think about. Before. I had something on here maybe to add to your list too. So so using PPP or PPE, well, we all want to use PPP, but, but <laughs> using personal protective equipment and, and its limitations because one of the funny things that I see – like when people are using gloves and stuff like that, and this is at the store is, is they're wearing gloves and then their phone rings and they take their glove out of their, like they've been shopping throughout the store and then they take their phone up and they put their gloved hand with their phone up to their face. And I'm like, you might as well have just like, just rub that glove all over your face. Like, so, so like, you know, the limits of, of PP, you know, of, of the personal protective uh, equipment, things like that. I think we should really make sure we cover with people and, and, and our staff understand those things too. So, this is all. This is all good stuff. This is like what I'm. What I'm right in my wheelhouse. What I'm working on right now um, to develop uh, an internal course, and then again work with you on um, things that we're that we're covering, and um, and just really making sure that our staff are on top of this stuff when they when they come back. Um, Liz, this is. I think we were talking about this earlier today, me and Tom, and I and I was telling him I was like, one thing that I think Liz does really well that's going to serve her well in this new world is employee engagement. You cannot have actively disengaged employees working for your company in this new world. Do you what do you what do you think about that? Like making sure they're engaged in these processes, understand them, and that they're that they're part of these solutions, and that we don't have actively disengaged people working for us. So um, I, I think the the piece that could be added in there a little bit more strongly is a little bit more psychological safety. So okay. um, I, I think that that's that that needs to be key people don't really you know the old saying people don't really care what you think until they think that you care so there that message is going to fall on deaf ears if they don't think that that it's it's safe for them They're like just ugh, it just sounds like rhetoric so, so in, in this this whole agenda is still very squishy at the moment the whole idea came up last week hey we need some training and I know that we've been talking about what are we going to do inside of Castle Keepers and, you know, Matt's business and, and a couple of others. And it's like, hey, we're going to do it. Why don't we just do it for the industry? So you guys are kind of watching us make the sausage here, but we're going to have a program here in a, in a, in a few days that, that, that we'll be able to share um, in the channels that we're going to be able to do that. I think it was discussed yesterday that it would probably be better not to do that at this five o'clock hour because this is you know, for us, this is for the cleaning business owners and we need to come up with a, another venue and another time slot to, to do this. And yeah. 
I don't even know how long it's going to take. By the time we get done, you know, if we can squish this into two hours, that would be cool. It might be a little bit more. I, I, I don't know. Um, I wanted to, to hear, Liz, one more thing about the psychology of what she's saying, though, because I think that actually is – so that goes on the training, but I think that might even be good to talk a little bit about today because she's doing that really well. She's, you know, has her staff engaged right now, and then she's keeping her customers feeling safe too. So that's like a double – and that kind of goes back to this communication of getting back in business. So, um, sure, you know, you know, that might be, that's awesome for the training, but I'd love to hear Liz's thoughts on that a little bit more since she kind of brought that up. That kind of has my brain tweaking a little bit. Do you have any tips for people that they can kind of engage their employees and then also maybe the flip side of that, their, their customers when they're getting ready to, to reopen? So I think a lot of us have been um, trying to really keep in contact with our employees and staying engaged and doing a really good job there. And I also think that we've, most of us have been doing a really good job of trying to stay connected to our, our clients, but we've been sending them a little bit of a mixed message, right? Um, if you're closed, if your business is closed, the message has been, listen, it's not safe for us to come into your home. And so just all of a sudden saying, hey, we've decided on this day, it's going to be safe. <laughs> it's gonna be a little bit of a struggle. People aren't going to accept that. So. That's why I'm talking about, you know, having to kind of sneak up on it a little bit, start adding in a little bit. Um, one one thing is uh, we know that a lot of our customers, but Matt, you have a great example. You've sold how many gift cards and people are donating how much money to your employees that they want to help. They really do. I was joking around a little bit with Tom earlier, but it's not really a joke. It's that people really want to help you so much they're willing to give you money not to come into their home <laughs> i'll pay you a lot of money as long as you don't come here so changing that narrative is really it's not going to be a one-step process it's not one email it's not one email that goes out that says hey we've decided it's safe now so you can trust us because we've been paying attention and that that's not going to cut it so um, what I was saying earlier is I think it needs to start with, hey, look at this new trend. We're really excited about this trend. We know you guys are too. Showing maybe like Tom showed, Tom put that link in there of how we're beginning to flatten the line, at least for the resources that are needed. You know, start there maybe. And again, starting with safety. Oh, uh, what's the name of that triangle, Tom? The one that I always Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yes, thank you. So starting with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the bottom level is safety. Right? People need to feel safe and they can't hear your next message until they feel safe. So hitting that first, hitting that message of safety first. Hey, look, it looks like it's starting to get safer out there. And then the next next thing up from there is, oh, yep, now that we see that. We're, we would love it. We know that you guys want to help us. You've been helping us all along. Here's a new way that you can help us get on the schedule, you know, yeah. and then start to start to talk to them about how they can help you and then how you're going to be able to help them. And then just keeping just keeping that communication going for safe, 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 help, help, help. We're back to normal because everybody wants to get back to normal really desperately. I love that. I'm going to make sure that that we, you know, really use some of those ideas in some upcoming communications as we kind of drip, drip, drip this information out, yeah. getting ready to getting ready to, to resume. In the training that we're talking about doing, everything that we do that's in preparation for this to make them safer, to make us better, we need to be to tell that story. It's almost like you know, Christmas is coming. It's 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 yeah. We're, we're, it's, it's, we're, we're being presumptive as we start telling yeah. the story. So when it's time to start, it's not a it's not a shock. It's like, well, yeah, even, this has been coming for a couple of weeks. Yeah, I agree. And I like the idea of of getting them to help us by getting on the schedule now. You know, and uh, and so tapping into a couple of things I had mentioned before, which was the scarcity mindset and also this loss aversion, both of those things. So um, one way of doing that would be like if you're closed right now, listen, we know that we're going to be ramping up. Like you said, Matt, you kind of have a date, just throw a date out there. You got to have an anchor. There's got to be something. Throw your date out there and then start getting people on the schedule. Help us out by getting on the schedule for the first whatever. And people that get us on the schedule will do blank for them. 
or get on the schedule now because we know that there's going to be such a rush on cleaning that we're worried anybody that any of our current best clients don't contact us now that we won't be able to get them on for another month. You know, so that's that loss aversion thing. People are like, if I don't have to wait a month. Um, somebody else had a, a what I thought was a really great idea was to um, maybe talk about um, why why should they want to help you? What what will they get out of helping you? Like kind of creating this relationship because we know that this is a relational business, right? So we don't want to turn it financial if we don't have to. Because once you ch change a, a relationship from a relational to fiduciary, you, it's hard to go back. And then it's really everything's about the money. So you want to try and keep it away from everything being about the money, especially when we start up. It's not going to be easy for us. We're going to, we're going to, we want to be able to charge a lot of money because for these initial cleans, we don't want to be going broke while we're hiring these, bringing on our new people. But, you know, it's tricky. That, that's, a, that's a kind of tough balancing act I think you just brought up. I think a lot of people are worried they're going to come back in after a month and it's going to be deep clean after deep clean with these customers. I think that's part of your communication too is if there's a lot of deferred maintenance, do you want us to do a deep clean or are you, or can we catch it up over time and I think you're going to need to communicate that with your customers, um, you know, pretty clearly because um, I would I would suggest tell them, hey, you know, we're happy to do a deep clean the first time if it's been a while for us to be in. Um, but you know, if if not, if there's a lot of deferred maintenance, the house probably won't be perfectly clean the first time. We'll stay on your budget and we'll do a great as great a job as we can and focus on a lot of those really high touch traffic area, high traffic, mm -hmm. high touch areas, and uh, we'll catch you up over the next couple of visits. Um, but yeah, I would, I would love to try and sell everybody on deep cleans when we get back. Cause we're going to have less customers, you know, to start with. So it'd be great if a lot of them were like, yeah, I definitely need a deep clean. Like that would, you know, so, you know, instead of, instead of serving, you know, 25, you know, instead of serving 55 to 60 customers a day, even if we only have 25 the first day, you know, we're, we're pretty high on revenue because we're, we're, we're doing that. The other thing to really think about too, is, is as you come back, some of your staff is not going to be ready to come back um, because they're going to have childcare issues. They're going to have some other things that they need to have sorted out. And how do you, how do you kind of communicate with them that they still have a job and that they're safe um, and you just need them to get those things taken care of and you understand. Liz, are you, are you seeing that childcare became a pretty big issue for your, your staff out in Washington or are, are those centers open or closed or how's that working? Everything's closed here. So we're in the same boat as everybody else. Um, Assumption school is going to be closed for the balance of the year. Yes. Yep. They, they officially, not the assumption. Officially, they've been closed. The schools, but what about what about child care centers? Though a lot of those will probably have to reopen. No, they're going to have to reopen, but right now they're still all closed. Okay. Yep. So you know, we have five people that have children that are you know that are, are probably eligible for the FSCRA. Um, that are going to have to be dealt with in one way, shape, or form. So dealing with that too. You said something, Matt, that made me think of a really good idea. I, I lost it. I was going to write it down. I started to, and I forgot. Uh oh, sorry. Like, say it again, Matt. Matt. Oh. Yeah, say it again, Matt. <laughs> right, yeah. I don't even know what I was talking about. I know I was just talking about uh, just spooling up your employees and, and getting them ready. But um, oh, yeah, that's I, it. You did it again. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. We need to we need to tap into that that one of the reasons why you want to get your house all the way, why you're going to need that deeper cleaning, et cetera, is because everybody's been there, right? The kids have been there and it, it's too much work for you. You've been putting all of your effort into keeping everything disinfected. And so now we need to, and th this is another chance for us to, to educate the public again, right? So now you need to get us, get us in there to do some cleaning. So funny because we're kind of going to go backwards. Would we also be pitching spending extra time on all your high touch surfaces? If you've been closed, absolutely you're going to do that. If you've been open, you've already been doing that. So the mm -hmm. companies that have already been open, that's what they've been spending a lot of their time, energy, and effort on. So, but if you've been closed, absolutely. I think if you're closed, you got a, a much better pitch to go in there and do um, a, a deep cleaning and get everything all cleaned at one time. But you also have this nice little 
scarcity piece that you can only fit so many deep cleans in in a day, right? So if you're go if you know you're going to want that deep clean, you need to let us know now so that we can get you on. So I think the, the longer list we have of people that are saying, yes, as soon as you open, get me on the schedule, the better. We, we need a list that's 500 names long, right? So that we can start plugging, 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 because we want to be able to spool up fast. Otherwise, you know how hard it's going to be to spool up with only eight weeks of time? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the other, the other part of that is the much longer list of prospective customers and former customers and how many of them out there after going through this might see more value in your service that you know, we're, we're assuming that we're going to start off slow but if you look at that larger population i'm curious as to how many of those are going to say well you know i hadn't had my home clean in a while but doggone it, i'm going to do it now yeah, yeah. I, mean, I will tell you i know of a company that's in colorado that is has kind of fought the shelter in place order and, and got lawyers involved and, and they're open and they has, they say they've never been busier before. And, um, they are, you know, they are basically saying that they've never had so much demand before, um, which, you know, flies in, you know, a little bit of what I was experiencing, but maybe that's, maybe that's because he, this, this owner did a really good job communicating why cleaning was important and why like, you know, what the, you know, what the value proposition was. Um, I, I personally wouldn't have gone the same route, but I mean, he, I firmly believe he believes in what he's doing and, and that's in, and I think he's doing it in a safe and ethical way. So, you know, I'm a little jealous of like, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. So, you know, part of me is like, you know, like, you know, a little jealous that he's rocking it right now and, and, you know, he's thriving through this, he's going to get his PPP money and be, basically pocketing it all, you know, so, um, but you know, there, there is, there is some evidence out there that when we reopen, there is some pent up demand that's going to be, that's going to be available for us to capture. Denise wants to know if you can share the name of that company. She's in Colorado. I, I cannot. Cause I, I don't know that. I don't know that they would want that. Uh, lawyers involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lawyers are, lawyers are involved. So, yeah. Um, I, I do know that they, they, they did spend some money getting lawyers involved to fight the stay at home order and, and, uh, have been, uh, successful at staying open at this point. So that's, uh, that's, that's a different, a different animal. I, I personally am, you know, I'm not, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. I just like, that wouldn't be my personality to, to go that far. Like I'm more of a, uh, I'm not really like one to like try and fight the power. Like I'm like, all right, that's the rules. Like I'll stay within the structure of, of the, of the system and I'll figure it out. Um, but some people, you know, they, they figure out how to, how to buck that. And, and this company did. And I think uh, they're, they're thriving through it. So. Well, and there's some value to this last man standing idea, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're <laughs> operating and nobody else is, I, going to be business. I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure that has something to do with that. That's why I'm not saying the name. <laughs> yeah. If they're closed, and the uh, blog post that Matt showed earlier is worth taking a hard look at because you really need to clearly explain. You know, these are the reasons why we close. These are the things that we're looking for to open, and like what Liz was saying, constantly monitor that progress it's like remember there's like three things that we're looking for you know peak hospital use making sure the ppp is out there or ppe rather is uh you know available and you know any type of you know legislative whatever that's telling so we shouldn't do it and you know we're okay on the hospital beds and we understand that you know all the ppe is on the way and we the believe other thing the other yeah. thing I didn't address is, is the OSHA guidelines of, of risk. And then there's also some other risk assessments by job that, um, that the New York times did like this graphical risk assessment by, by jobs. Have you guys seen this? I wish yeah, I saw uh, it'd be kind of cool if we brought, if we brought it up. Jobs are safer than, you know, working at a retail store or food service archives. 60, 60 times safer than working at a retail store by, <laughs> by, by contact, yeah, by con, by by con, by contact with the public per day. So a maid has between a maid has between 
like like uh, 12 and between 12 and 42 contacts with the public per day, a maid or a janitor between the two jobs. Okay. And, and that's with, that's with, you know, if they go to the grocery store things like that, if they, if they, if they don't do any of that and they just go home, like, but, but, but between 12 and 42, a, a retail clerk has between 200 and 600 contacts per day with the public, depending on what, you know, what job it is, how busy the place is, things like that. And that may be declining with some of these restrictions they're putting in place where they're only allowing one family member in stores and, but there's and doing still, like handing cards and money back and oh forth. My gosh. There's no social distancing there. And some of it is just moving the carts around just because like, so some of the, some of the contacts with the public that they're counting, like if like where it's really high is they're going out and collecting the carts. Well, each one of those carts was touched by a person and they go out and collect 150 carts. There's 150 mm -hmm. potential contacts right there. What like, you know, they didn't actually even have to get near the person. So um, the, the risk, the risk factor for our job versus other jobs is exponentially smaller. And so Can you find um, study and I'll share it on the uh, cleaning business today uh, resource page. Yeah, I'll try and I'll try and find it. It was a New York Times article a couple of weeks ago That's about uh, different That's careers true. and their exposure. It was really it was really mostly about how low low pay jobs are actually uh, much more likely to ex be exposed to the coronavirus than it was a um, necessarily like job for job, what is the most dangerous job? Because it didn't have doctors on there or anything like that, but it had nurses and compared, you know, compared nurses and, and then retail clerks. And like that. But it was more of a study of how lower wage jobs are more, are exponentially more um, in contact with this disease than a lot of other careers, basically. I think I've heard the term exponential used so much over the last few weeks with- well, exponential growth and everything else. I think the growth is less exponential now. It was only, it was, I was, I put a post out on my Facebook where it only went up 8%. Most of the current data is coming in better than what was projected. Yeah. And I guess the whole, the whole part of that is, you know, what's the counter argument? If all of these preventative measures and stay at home wasn't happening, what would it look like? So we'd have a million people, we'd have a million people dead and it would be, we'd have a, a healthcare system overwhelmed. I mean, that's the, that's the counter argument that you have to be prepared. You, you know, some, I think the UK was, was originally that that was their argument that we're just going to, we're just going to let this rip. Do you remember that? Like that was like a couple of weeks ago, the UK we'll was, all get it and then it'll be over with and we'll all be immune and they we're just going to let it rip. And then they started seeing their hospitals fill up and they're like, Oh, this might not be so smart. Like we're already at like, like, 30,000 cases into this like one or two weeks of letting it rip thing. They had their schools open up until like a week ago. I mean, they were all in on just like, and so I think the UK is in for it pretty bad because they're pretty far behind the social distancing. So what we'll have to look at and see what their per capita numbers look like with some of the delay. The they, and their uh, prime minister is in ICU as of last night. Is yeah, he, he was shaking coronavirus patients' hands with no gloves in the ICU. He was like proud of that. Like he was going around to the ICUs and like like mad grabbing like like patients and like handling them like literally like just to show like how safe it was. Um, like last or maybe two weeks ago, I think there was some video of him doing that. And then there was another of him with like where he's like in a lab handling the virus and he's not wearing gloves and just like oh no wonder God. he's no wonder he's sick. I mean, he made some choices that I wouldn't I wouldn't have even thought to, but yeah. I, I pray that he's that he's gonna recover. I think that that would be, you know, tragic, but you know, that there was some obvious things that he did that were probably not very smart in the in hindsight at this point. So yeah. I heard he was in ICU though. He's in ICU, he's on oxygen but not on a breathing machine. So he's Oh that's good. So they yeah. say <laughs> so they so they so they say exactly. So he has turned over he has turned over day-to-day -day operations of the government to his deputy. So that's not a necessarily a great. A I mean, great they, they put you in a vent. I mean, you're like incapacitated. You're out, right? Well, they, they, you have to be um, usually, uh, they usually, because you're struggling so much because you're, I don't really want to get into too much of this, but yes, they have to put you unconscious. Oh, come um, on. All the gross stuff. No, yeah. we don't want to do that. Yeah. Hey, Liz, I got a question for you. I know that you have studied uh, consumer behavior as it pertains to quality scores and how they kind of go up and down. And you can, you're, you're pretty good at anticipating trends based on certain things in the business. 
for companies that have, I mean, what are the quality scores looking like now that, you know, everybody's kind of concerned about the coronavirus and for companies that have been shut down and they start opening up, I mean, would you expect to see them to be better, be worse? What, what would we be looking for in that regard? So I, I don't know, Tom. I haven't actually put a lot of thought into it because, you know, I've, I've been open. So um, in Olympia and I haven't really thought a lot about it, but my off the off the top of my head, I would think that initially the scores are going to be higher and then they're going to drop. They're going to be fast. They're going to be not happy and they're going to be really unhappy when they see any small thing. Uh, that's just my initial thought. Uh, and it's because my thinking there is, yay, good. I need my house cleaned, but it's going to be more important than ever that you do a good job. So yay, I'm happy, high score. But if I see anything that indicates to me that you didn't actually clean, sanitize, and disinfect my house, I'm going to be PO'd. What are, what are you seeing in, 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 within your own business in Olympia? Are there, you know, are, are customers more demanding now? Customers are more demanding, but they're also really happy and thankful and grateful. So our scores are actually a little bit higher right now, but they are very, very demanding. But again, you know, the people that are going out to clean are much more, you know, they're much more committed and much more devoted to doing a really great job. So the re it's twofold why the, the scores are better. The people are actually more careful. In, in what they're doing and they're doing a better job maybe i mean it's the they are up. doing a better job they are now they're not maybe necessarily doing a better job in some areas i really have always had a problem with the vacuum cleaners so i'm like just quick vacuum you guys i don't like that no the aerating of everything i just don't like it even yeah. if it's um you know a really good vacuum cleaner just that that bar kicking stuff up into the air just doesn't sound good to me so um, we have not been doing a great job of vacuuming. I, I know we haven't because I'm like quick, just quick back you guys on the main walk areas. And we're telling the clients that too. Don't, you know, don't clean everything. So when we go in, we're going to have to clean under beds really well. Eh, everything's going to have to be put a deep huh. clean on the floors. I, I don't see, no, you, you, see that, you see that the vacuuming being a risk. I don't see it as being a, a risk because if it's dry, if the, the virus is dry, um, it dies pretty quickly. So like if, you know, like encapsulated in dust and things like that, it, it would be pretty low risk. Um, so I wasn't I, much worried about the stuff that's on the carpet. Uh -huh. I'm worried about the stuff still in the air and oh. getting the airflow going, oh. right? And blowing the airflow around because anything that, like that I expel begins to drop immediately, yeah. right? Goes yeah. out and begins to drop. But yeah, as soon as, so. yeah. I and guess and again, you know, we all have our own little yeah. things that, I mean, that it, make us crazy. And it gets back to it's a novel virus. The research we were all we're just kind of guessing based. Yeah, on we we don't know. Virus. We don't know for sure. You're right. Um, and I, yeah. my 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 guess on that is that that's probably a fairly low risk um, thing to worry about. Be, but but the other the other side of that is, if the, if the virus is aerosol, let's say there was someone sick in the house. Um, the airflow might actually help it sink versus, you know, but it, you're right. It might start up initially, but if the house, the air was still like, you know, people just walking through the house and moving might get the air just to, to sink on its, on its own. I, but again, it's just, it, this speculation, we really don't know how any of it, they don't even really, they don't even have a good transmission model on the ship because if it is aerosol, I would think the transmission would be way worse than it is. Like, like in St. Louis, they just shut down all the public parks because they're worried about transmission in, in public spaces. And people were being dumb and they were like having picnics and parties. And, and, and honestly, St. Louis is not always the brightest place in the world for like, we're not really rule follow. Like, you know, we're not actually as a, as a city much rule followers. We're kind of like the show me state. You got to prove us wrong, basically kind of thing. And it's, and like that, that motto sometimes doesn't work in our favor. Um, but uh, anyway, the, they had to shut down the parks. And I don't know that there has been a whole lot of proof that, that you know, if you're outside, um, you know, uh, that, that there is as much risk. And, and um, 
so I ride bikes a lot. We talked about this last time I was on. And so like they've banned group group bike rides, which I think is smart. But they're they're thinking that an asymmetric rider could be like putting out this like cone of like destructive air for like like you would have to be like 40 feet behind this person to be completely safe. If that's the case, man, I would think there'd be way more transmission of this than we're already seeing. What do you, what do you, I mean, I don't know. We're, we're getting off. Track. I mean, I don't know as, as professional house cleaners, this is probably a little, little beyond scope, but you know, I, I, I think about that, you know, I'll go out for a run and like, I'm, I see somebody coming at me and I kind of like get on the other side of the road and you know, somebody's in front of me. It's like, Stop I'm thinking, breathing. I'm thinking of vapor trails, you know, it's like, is this person, am I breathing their dirty air? And no, I, dude. Yeah. So, I, I think, uh, I think about that too. So again, I, I, you know, there's certain risks I'm going to take, I'm going to go outside and get some fresh air. I'm going to go on, I'm going to go on a run tonight and, and, uh, I'll probably, you know, cross paths with somebody and they'll, they'll have left some vaporized air. And, so back to the vacuums. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know that you're wrong. I don't know that you're right. I think it's an interesting, know, it's an interesting I idea. I noticed David Kaiser uh, was on here earlier, and I know that he's actively involved with Serious Cleaning Industry Research Institute. And I know they do all kinds of research about vacuum cleaners and spread of pathogens. And you know, David, if you're still here, and if you have any uh, any research on that, you could share. Maybe uh, you could come on in a you know another another call, another another Facebook Live, and give us the real scanning on what. Uh, what we need to know about using vacuums and, and the spread of pathogens. So Winter Hale had a good question about uh, feather dusters, vacuums, brushes, make sure there's no cross contamination. I can share what we're doing if, uh, if that makes sense. Um, did we lose Liz? She might uh, have, had, oh, there she is. Um, so, so we don't use feather dusters per se, Winter. We use uh, microfiber sleeves that go over we have two different lengths of dusters, one long and one a little shorter, and they both have kind of different uh, structures. I actually have some in the car and I can show them on another, you know, send some pictures to Tom. But anyway, we only use one of each per house and then we wipe down the handles and, the, and everything in between. We're, we're washing down our vacuums, our mop poles. We're actually washing, we're taking our caddies apart in the car, washing down every bottle um, and we're also, um, uh, doing, um, the sides of any of, of the mop buckets, the, and the, the, we use a, it's not really a mop bucket, but we do a self-contained mop system where the mops are pre-soaked in solution. And, um, anyway, so that is being washed, uh, when we're coming out of properties and we're only doing empty properties right now. And we're going through all those extra stuff. Like the only thing I'm doing right now is commercial and empty, you know, non, non occupied spaces. And we're still doing all that. Um, so, uh, that's, that's what we're doing. I don't know if, if Liz, are you going to that, to that extreme or, or is that sort of the, the mindset you have too? Yeah, we are. Um, a, a lot of that again is for psychological safety more than anything in our case. Um, but yeah, we are, we're, we're wiping everything down with a, a disinfectant cloth that, I think it says it has like a, a one minute, you know, has to remain wet for one minute versus, or it might even be a 30 second cloth that we got. And so, yeah, we're wiping it's everything not, down. A hydrogen, like a hydrogen peroxide, like a medical grade. Yeah. 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 Hydrogen sure peroxide. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, we, like the, I like the hydrogen peroxide to, for that reason. And yeah. I don't want to, key everyone in on hydrogen peroxide because I want to get my hands on plenty of it when it get, when it becomes available. But what I do like about it is that it actually is a pretty good cleaning agent and it has pretty low dwell times as low as 30 seconds typically. Um, anyway, that's, and that's going to be, you know, when that becomes readily available, that's a, that's going to be a great product. However, it, it is caustic at higher concentrations needed to, uh, to actually be a disinfectant. So, it can cause damage to surfaces, um, and, it, and it oxidizes iron and some other some other metals. So you have to be careful of. And I, I don't want to go into the deep in the weeds and the technical stuff today. But that that is, it it, it has its pluses and minuses. All of these products do have their pluses. It's and a minuses. little acidic, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, and it, it, it is. That's what I mean by, by it's caustic. So it reacts to it reacts to iron and creates oxidation um, in higher concentrations above about three percent per volume. 
And most of them are typically like 1% or 1.5%. And honestly, it can be as low as half a percent and still be effective. Um, but it just depends on what the EPA has said, you know, basically, right? But there have been studies that show that it's an effective disinfectant down to about 0.5%. Anyway, the, it's product by product. You got to go by what whatever the label is if you're using it as a disinfectant. But in higher concentrations, it can cause problems. So you you don't want to just mix your own hydrogen peroxide and count on that to be safe because- And then it, fog. <laughs> I heard yeah. somebody talking yeah. about that. I'm serious. I heard somebody saying they were going to do that. I was like- With hydrogen peroxide? Hydrogen peroxide makes a great foggy agent, but I would think you'd want to go with something commercially made versus- like, well, You don't want to ruin your own. You need to have the right PP. Yeah. yeah. I think that hydrogen peroxide, they use it for, for safe rooms, um, but you don't want to be in that room. What they do is they put a machine in the middle of the room and they fog the room while they're not there. So they use it in labs and stuff like that to, to create clean rooms because it really is super effective as an antimicrobial, um, you know, vir like kills viruses, kills spores, kills really everything yeah. in the right concentrations. But it, incredibly could be incredibly dangerous. So I hope people are like, you know, with these, all these new technologies that they're that's my concern that that's really part of the training that, 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 that we want to do is, you know, just yeah. help people understand there's some risks associated with some of these really cool tools out there. And if you're going to use them, um, take the GBAC course, you know, the, the one through Arxy. So, you know, you have a, a, a good understanding of, of what you need to know and the risks associated with it. Yeah, I think that that's my, that's one of my big concerns for a lot of what's going on right now. There's going to be a lot of, when I said gimmicky stuff earlier, it's not that it's gimmicky, it's that done wrong, you know, like we're adding complexity to our businesses that we don't necessarily have the, the training for ourselves. And then we're trying to have our, our technicians do this stuff. And you have to remember most of your technicians don't have half the technical knowledge you have. So if you don't understand it really well and you don't have the ability to communicate that stuff to them really well and train them to be safe, I would be very cautious of those of those things. And again, getting back to reopening, you know, I think that those things can be really things that you can sell well. And I, I'm buying a couple of electrostatic cleaners for some of my commercial properties. Um, I think that, that, that it has its place. And, um, you know, especially we have these gym spaces in a lot of these... Um, apartments that we serve and there there's we have these beautiful apartments and they have these gyms that kind of put like you know like you know like a club fitness or whatever your local gym is it kind of puts them to shame but man like like those are probably going to be hot spots right i like i want to just go in there and like ghostbuster those places like so having those services when you reopen makes sense for areas like that but like do we want to go into people's homes and be fogging them like what did they do in there that they need to have their house fogged like what happened like it's it doesn't seem like the risk versus the reward is there. It seems that's what I mean, where it seems kind of gimmicky. Um, but I want to I want to be clear. Like I think there's a place for it. I think you can do um, you can do that as part of your communication plan to reopen and, and how that can help people. But I think you should understand it well. And I don't have a good grasp on how to use that stuff. Yeah. And I consider myself pretty technical in in my knowledge of cleaning, and I don't even understand how. I would use that effectively in people's homes. And if it's if it's no substitute. There's not, you know, it's not an apples and apples trade off in terms of, oh, yeah, I'm not going to wipe down surfaces. I'm just going to fog everything. <laughs> I mean, there's some efficacy in certain circumstances, but you know, you're you're far from you know truly sanitizing, disinfecting surfaces the same way you could if you were using the proper paint, and the proper wipers. Yeah. You know, we talked about that earlier today, Tom. So we talked about like, we've been talking about communicating with, with your clients. It's the difference between it's what, what did we, how did we describe it earlier? We were talking, we were saying it's the difference between, you know, removing it completely versus just kill. It's like basically putting a pesticide in your house versus it's like you were describing a mouse, right? Like, so go ahead and you do your analogy. Yeah, you don't have, you know, if you have a mouse in your house, you don't have to kill it. If you can just capture it and let it go outside, you've kind of done the same thing. So, you know, I think there's a mis misconception out there that we need to go in with strong disinfectants and kill every germ in the house. And there's a lot of germs that really that are good. We need them in order to survive. You know, you got, you know, stuff in your colon that, you know, we, we need that, you know. But, um, 
you don't have to kill a lot of germs, but you know, catching them through the normal cleaning process and using the right tools to remove them from the home safely is, is just as good and sometimes better because you aren't bringing you know these these poisons into your house when you're doing that. I'm not saying disinfectants are bad, but you know there's a balance, and we, we need to understand what the real objective is. We want to get the uh, pathogens off of the high touch areas so we aren't getting them in our hands and sticking them in our mouth and our eyes. And yeah. at this point, you can do that a lot of different ways. You don't have to kill everything. Yes, Liz. Tom, so i just point out here that it is 306. You need to get your link up for us. And um, we, did have a, we did have a couple of questions here. Um, Wintel wants to know, Matt, if you could share where you get your dusters, maybe with Tom and he could put it, put it in a link maybe, unless you have it somewhere um i think i get them from the place that's on uh i think it's the so uh cleaning business today who's the sp who's your microfiber sponsor tom um yeah, that's a good question uh, uh, direct mop oh? direct mop sales that's who i buy it from because they give me a good discount uh um, they're 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 a good vendor so i get my dusters from direct mop sales so we're getting we're killing two birds with one stone here so <laughs> You go to cleaningbusinessday.com. Oops, I'm taking you to their website. There you go. Yeah, um, direct, direct mop sales. But yeah, you can find the link right on uh, Cleaning Business Today. It's, it's like a pop-up for uh, for them. I, we've been using them for a couple of years now. Um, they have good like, price. The price is good and they, and they have good shipping, free shipping too. So I also used to use another company that I like and I don't wanna not say their name because I think they have good products if you wanna look at them too. Um, would be uh, Mops Plus um, or Mops Direct. I think they go under either name. Or no, no, Mops Plus uh, or Microfiber Plus or Mops Plus. I'm sorry. And uh, they have good pricing, good products, um, but they have high, high shipping minimums. So unless you're ordering a lot, it can be um, a little bit pricey to order from them. Um, but I think that they'll work with you if you're ordering, you know, like a pallet worth of microfiber, but if you're just getting a box worth, it can be it can be a little bit pricey. Right here. Okay. Um, Eloisa also is asking about the name of the vacuum study. Tom, I think you referenced David on that, maybe. Yeah, I was alluding to the fact that uh, Cleaning Industry Research Institute studies stuff like that, and I know that they've 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 got studies. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to David. I made a note to, to ask him if he could share some information. We'll get him on a call here not too far in the uh, distant future, and, and he can share some of that information with us. Um, I wanted to kind of finish one thing about, um, about what we're kind of going forward with, and that's kind of pivoting or transforming and, you know, what, what's moving, what's, what's next. And that's kind of maybe a future conversation. I, want to, I don't want to end on that. But I want to share that, like, my business is pivoting, but I'm not changing everything just to to do this. So, um, and maybe that's a, a topic for a future con conversation. But um, that's sort of where where I'm kind of thinking into the future. Of maybe next time you have me on. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, it is time for us to really start working on what is the business going to look like when things open up and we start doing business in the post COVID-19 world. Um, cleaning business today, you guys know the website, subscribe over here to the right, you get our uh, newsletters. Um, we had Joe here yesterday and he's working on a press release for us. And I know that he's got a draft out there. I'm hoping he'll have something uh, for us that we can send out in a uh, newsletter uh, tomorrow, if not later this week for sure. So. Um, something that you can share with uh, local media as well as the press about the, uh, some of the gaps in the logic with how the PPP works and then uh, the $6 an hour uh, federal uh, unemployment above and beyond whatever the state. You put those what? two together and it what? might be. What are you talking about? $6, $6 an hour. <laughs> okay, whatever. I was making up new stuff. We are yeah. not having six dollars. We're happening fast. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's all. But you, you, well, well thought out, well reasoned government programs done overnight. No. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so if you don't know what we're talking about with the PPP um, conversation and um, what, what we're looking to have done, not we, Joe, Joe Walsh started this, but we're in full support. Watch the Facebook Live from yesterday. I think you can get a pretty good recap if you just watch the end of the Facebook Live. You have to watch, you have to watch the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> also, Joe, I, Joe, I wanted to remind you. Go ahead. Yeah, oh my gosh, yes he is, he's awesome. Um, just one more thing, um, I wanted to make sure that everybody understands the reason why we are putting this link in for the cleaning business today, every day, is not just because we want more people to sign up for cleaning business today and we just need more customers. <laughs> it's because we really want more people to get this message. So please share that link, help us to get this message out. We're looking to, we, we really want, and we're very committed to doing whatever it takes. You see, we every day, we have at least two people or three people on this call giving up an hour a day, every single day, minimum, not including any kind of prep time, to share um, some free resources, ideas, thoughts. And so please share that link for us um, to, to help us get that message out more. Prep time? Prep time. prep time. Tom doesn't do any prep time. That that's that's a new concept. And we do an hour of prep time and, and war planning every morning. What are you talking? Well, that's about? got me getting up at like four fifty every morning now. You get me into that. I, I'm yes. telling you, I feel better. I, for all you people, that's what I talked about last time. Is I needed to get back on my routine and calendar out my day, and I've done it. And I'm. I'm up at 5 a.m. I'm a little tired right now. I'm a little grumpy, but I still got to get a run in, and then I'll call it. I'll call it a good day. I did everything on my calendar. If I do that, just don't be running yeah, behind anybody. No, I won't. All right, guys. Uh, anything else? Thank you, Bridget. Uh, yeah. Are we good? That's it. I don't have anything for Tom to tell it like it is today. <laughs> I'm sorry. Listen, we'll get you tomorrow, Tom. <laughs> I don't have anything for you to tell it like it is today, we'll but I'll have some that. tomorrow. We'll have that tomorrow, and. Uh, We'll yeah. have a little more information. We're developing the, the, the outline, getting our material together for this uh, uh, training class that we want to do for, for training in the post-COVID-19 world. So um, I guess we need to figure out what channels we're going to do that on and how we're going to how we're going to make that accessible to everybody. And um, I guess people were asking for some type of certificate of, 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 of completion. So we'll have a little quiz or something. If they complete that, we'll, we'll get a certificate. Um, We'll have we'll have more information on the next couple of days as to how that's going to work. But I see us actually having that done and in the books and and behind us and complete and people taking the program currently by this time next week. Cool, I'm excited yeah. about so it. So get your employees ready, y'all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's time to it's time to start getting everybody back in in the mode to work. We're right homes. We got a lot of homes to claim. Liz is I doing them all. Liz is doing them all for us, and that not to be named comp company out in Colorado is cleaning all the houses. So yeah. it's uh, it's clean. <laughs> there's yeah. demand. There is demand. We're ready to open, and there will be customers. So that's a good thing. So with, all right, with, a, whole, with a whole new purpose. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay, guys. Thanks a bunch. Yeah. We'll see you tomorrow, five o'clock Eastern. Bye. Bye, y'all.